There we go. Pack South, how you doing? Woo! Pretty good. One more time. How are you doing? Woo! Good. Good. It's so awesome to see all of you. So happy so many of you came to this. Welcome, welcome. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aaron Saduco. I'm the founder of With a Terrible Fate. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Dan Hughes, uh, who's a video game analyst for the site. And he's also the mind behind the series of articles for the site. It's going to be the focus of our talk with you today. Uh, has anyone here heard of WithATerribleFate.com before? Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, we're a pretty small outlet, so it's, it's really rewarding for us when we come out to things like this and uh, meet people who know us, so that's great. For those of you who don't know us, uh, we are an online publication that focuses exclusively on articles and other content that analyzes the storytelling of video games with the, game, with the hope of just better understanding how video games work as a storytelling medium. Uh, so we love coming to cons like this, we love talking to other gamers, uh, because really that's where a lot of the insights into video game storytelling come from, just conversation with other people who love games uh, and who are thinking about this stuff. So that's the site. Uh, the series that Dan runs that we'll be talking about today is called Now Loading the Video Game Canon, uh, which seeks to answer the question that's the title of this panel, uh, which games belong in the video game canon, or put differently, which video games do you need to have played in order to really understand and appreciate how video games tell stories in unique and distinctive ways, and how they continue to innovate uh, in storytelling, quite generally. So the format of this uh, next hour is going to be roughly as follows. For the next 15 minutes, I'm going to be talking with you about what it means for there to be a video game canon, what canons are more generally, and why it might be useful, especially right now in the history of video games, to develop a video game canon. Then for 15 minutes, Dan is going to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of his series with you. He's going to actually walk you through one of the articles that he's written for the series, discussing whether or not The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time deserves to be in the video game canon. Uh, and then for the last 30 minutes, we're really excited because we've brought with us a list of 10 different games to choose from. We're going to do a little activity where we ask you all to vote on which game you'd like to discuss with us. And then in place of a regular Q&A, we're going to try to hold a discussion where we argue and talk about whether or not that chosen game belongs in the video game canon. So I hope you stick around all the way through that. I'm excited. Hope you are too. But before we get to any of that, I have to make sure my clicker is working. Oh, that's mm -hmm. super. All right. Before we get to any of that, we need to ask, what is a canon? If we're talking about whether games belong in the video game canon, we better have a good idea of what a canon is. And it turns out that this is actually a point of confusion oftentimes when we're publishing these articles on the site because there's a common usage of canon these days uh, when you talk about video games, but also just when you talk about storytelling more generally. But it has virtually nothing to do with what we mean by a canon. So that usage uh, is what you might call a canon of events. So think of your favorite series of fiction. So The Legend of Zelda timeline is up there as an example. It could just as easily be Harry Potter or Mass Effect or whatever you want. Uh, it's become shorthand to talk about canon as those events in the series uh, that have been officially licensed in one way or another by the author of the series. So this timeline for Zelda would be representative of many of the canonical events in the series um, as licensed by Nintendo. Right? This is really useful shorthand because you know, often there are unlicensed spin-offs of series, so things like fan fiction or what have you, uh, and people who are talking about the games need a way of distinguishing what are the things that really happened in the series and how do we understand the continuity of different games. Uh, but it's not at all what we have in mind when we're talking about the canon. We're talking about something more like this, a canon of works. Uh, if anyone's taken a great books course in high school or in college, uh, they'll often present you with a syllabus that looks something like this, more or less. Probably more books, but these will probably be on it. Uh, and this is a kind of literary canon, where the idea is these are works that have made central contributions to how literature has evolved and how stories are told. Uh, but not only that, they're also works that are in conversation with one another and that have informed each other in really crucial ways. So Homer was one of the first storytellers ever, back when he told the Odyssey. Uh, in the oral tradition in Greece. Sophocles was no doubt familiar with those works when he wrote Oedipus Rex and was responding to that storytelling in a lot of ways. Dante was familiar with those when he wrote The Inferno and 
that work inspired him, and so on and so forth until you get to Ulysses, where if you're actually able to comprehend it, first explain to me what it's saying, because I can't. But uh, it involves all of those other works. It steals its structure from the Odyssey, and it has references to everything from Oedipus Rex to Hamlet and many others. This is the kind of canon that we're talking about. When we're talking about what games belong in a video game canon, what we're trying to find is just a set of games that are crucial to understanding how games tell stories uh, and can teach us something about where that storytelling has come from and where it might be headed in the future. There are pros and cons to thinking about really anything through the lens of canons, uh, literature, or indeed video games. And so before we subscribe to this method, we should think about what we're hoping to get out of it and what potential dangers there might be. What are the pros? Why might this be really useful? Well, the way I think about it is just in the sense that canons provide you with reference points, right? A set of fixed points that we're all aware of if we know about the canon and that we can use when we're thinking about stories and when we're talking with others about stories. That can help you in three major ways. Better understand others. When you're talking about video games with someone, especially nowadays when there are just so many games, it can be hard to get a productive conversation about the storytelling of any game off the ground unless you have some reference points to compare it to. So if you've all played something like, say, Ocarina of Time, to borrow Dan's example from later, that can be a reference point, and you can compare another game to Ocarina of Time in order to better understand what's going on in that game and just to speak the same language as the person who you're trying to describe this game to and evaluate the judgments of. It can also help you to better understand yourself. So I don't know about you guys, but oftentimes when I'm playing a game for the first time, I'll have a really visceral reaction to it in the sense that, you know, I, I have a feeling for whether it's good or bad, whether I like it, whether I don't. But it can be hard sometimes to go beyond that initial reaction and really ask myself, okay, I had a reaction. I'm someone who cares about understanding the stories of games, so I should ask myself, why is it that I'm having that reaction to this game? And if you have these reference points in the background, you can point to those other games when you're evaluating your own feelings and say, oh, the game was similar to this thing that this other game did that I liked. Maybe that's part of why I really enjoyed this. Or it was a new spin on this thing that I didn't like. Maybe part of why I enjoyed it was that it was actually successful where this other game failed miserably. Something of this sort. Uh, and then it helps you to understand other works, right? Because as I've already kind of alluded to, uh, when there are so many new games coming out, uh, it can be really hard to classify them or evaluate them if they're just sort of coming out of the ether. But if you have reference points, and if you have an arc of the overall development of storytelling in video games, you can situate other games in this story of how storytelling in video games has evolved over time, where games are going, how their storytelling has evolved, and you can see new games coming out as either contributing to that or detracting from that sense of progress in the overall medium. Those are the pros. But cannons are also really dangerous, not just video game cannons, uh, and not just the cannons that you shoot at people, but things like <laughs> literary cannons and the cannons that are taught to you in school, because they're implicitly exclusive across a variety of dimensions. And the ones I want to draw your attention to in particular are, first, they exclude other works, and second, they exclude other aspects of canonical works. So the other works, um, basically the idea is just, you know, as soon as you're talking about a canon of the works that were really important to understanding something like literature or video games, you're implicitly claiming that the other works, that is, the works that didn't make it into the canon, don't really matter, at least not for the purposes of the storytelling canon, right? And that can be pretty dangerous because you might end up being prejudiced against games that you just have never played or never heard of, or games that might be really interesting in other ways, uh, but just don't contribute to storytelling especially. So it's important to recognize that you're excluding games in that way and to not disregard games without giving them a second thought simply because you don't think they're a classic and merit even consideration for the canon. The second aspect, uh, even if you admit a work into, say, the storytelling canon of video games, by thinking about games in terms of the storytelling canon, you might end up ignoring other important ways that games can function. So games can function as a lot of different things, right? The one that we care about on the site just because of the site's mandate to think about storytelling in video games is video games functioning as storytelling devices. But you can also think of them just as mere games or as opportunities to socialize with your friends or as just simple entertainment uh, or as you know, ways to teach new ways of thinking, a variety of ways. And if you're just laser focused on the storytelling of video games, it can be easy to let those other functions of games sort of fade into the background. So it's important to be aware of that before you embark on this journey of trying to build a storytelling canon of video games. Those are some general considerations about what it means to have a canon, why it might be good, why it might be bad. I want to make a few suggestions to you before I turn it over to Dan.
about why it might be especially useful now to have a video game storytelling canon, given the state of the medium, especially given the state of overall discourse about video games. So, you've probably read at least some of the articles from at least some of the hodgepodge that I mashed together on the right side of that screen. Um, <laughs> they're great, honestly. Um, I, I really respect the journalism that a lot of those outlets do, um, but I think that there is a problem in the way that they review games and the way they think about evaluating games. And it kicks back to what I was just talking about on the previous slide, about games having various functions. Right? A game can serve as a method of telling stories, it can serve as a mode of entertainment, many other things. The point is that when these outlets review games, they often just mash all of these different functions together in an effort to give a game a single score about how overall good it is. And so they'll have sort of one grade for story, one grade for playability, replayability, a grade for graphics, this, that, and the other, how challenging it is, and then they'll sort of just average them into a score of how good the game is. I think that's a mistake to think about games in that way because it's not obvious that the game's success at a certain function, say telling a good story, has anything at all to do with its quality as, say, you know, a competitive event to play with other people like an eSport, right? And so by summing all of these functions together and trying to give the game a single score of being good or bad based on how it succeeds and fails across all these different areas, uh, I think is to confuse how we evaluate games quite generally. If you want an analogy, think about a knife, right? Knives can have different functions too. They can be used to cut things, they can also be used in ceremony as ceremonial knives, they can be used as investments if they're made of expensive materials. But I can have a really dull knife that's worth a lot of money, right? It would function great as an investment, not great as a mode of cutting something, right? So why should we suppose that a game's success at one function has anything to do with the other? So I think that by distinguishing these functions and saying, let's just focus on one of them. In our case, a storytelling canon of video games, but it could just as easily be focused on a different function if you like. We can focus more on what makes a game successful in that one dimension and really get more clarity into that as opposed to a hodgepodge of evaluations of the games that take all sorts of different approaches in a single review. The second reason why I think we could really use a video game storytelling canon specifically right now is that the storytelling of video games is still very embryonic, and our understanding of it is very embryonic. So games are at this really nice point where they're old enough to have a history. You can talk about the history of video games, where they've come from, where they're going, but they're still young enough that they're actively evolving, they're actively developing as a medium, and we really don't even understand very well the tools with which they tell stories. My favorite instance of this that crops up a lot in those reviews I was talking about was this notion of game feel, right? This kind of raw feeling that you get about whether or not a game feels good to play, right? I'm not saying there's nothing to the notion of game feel, I'm just saying it's a very imprecise notion and it shows that we have a lot more work to do in understanding how games tell the stories that they do and what makes them so interesting and so good to engage with. So I think that establishing a video game canon where we can understand stepwise how the storytelling has evolved can help us with that. Lastly, I don't know about you guys, but at least on the site, we're really interested in thinking about how video games specifically have made unique contributions to storytelling. That is to say, how they can tell stories that could not be told in other media, like a film, or a novel, or a play. And I think having a video game canon in the background is essential to that task. As an example, think of Spec Ops. Quick show of hands, who has played Spec Ops in here? Great, that's good. More of you should, it's a great game. Um, Critics loved it, there's been a lot written about it, um, and I think that's justified, because it really does tell a great story. It tells a story all about the psychological horrors of war, being driven insane by it, uh, and it's great. But here's a question for you. Spec Ops had its story basically directly taken from Apocalypse Now. So did Spec Ops succeed in telling a story that was uniquely fit for a video game? Did it use the tools unique to video games' disposal to tell a story that couldn't be told in any other way? Or was it just a great story because it took a great story from another medium, namely the medium of film and Apocalypse Now? And notice, by the way, as an aside, that this is a question you can ask of pretty much any storytelling medium, because Apocalypse Now, in fact, took its story from Heart of Darkness, a novel. So you can ask the same thing about Apocalypse Now. I think in order to answer these questions of how much a given medium contributes genuinely new things to the art of storytelling, we need the notion of a medium-specific canon so that we can understand how have video games really changed the landscape of storytelling? Before I turn it over to Dan, lastly, I just want to emphasize 
as overall context, both for what he's going to tell you and then for our ensuing discussion afterwards. The goal of this is not to establish some sort of ironclad list where you must have played these games or I'm not even going to talk to you about the storytelling of games. That's nonsense. And it's quite it's quite probable that we're not going to ultimately agree on a single list of games that belong in the video game canon. What I hope I've been emphasizing is that just thinking about games in terms of a canon represents a paradigm shift in how you're evaluating games, how you're thinking about their storytelling, uh, and just is a way to hone in on what each game contributes to the overall history of the medium as a way of telling new and exciting stories. Uh, and so my hope is that just by taking that paradigm shift, we can start to think differently about games collaborate with each other a little bit more in trying to determine this canon, and in so doing, learn a bit about how games tell stories. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and then after he talks a bit about Ocarina of Time, we will jump into some discussion. Hey, back south. How's it going? Woo! Still good. Good. All right, so my name's Dan. Um, like Aaron said, I've been running uh, this series called Downloading the Video Game Canon for a couple of months now. Um, and it is my intent uh, not to be sort of this lofty, uh, great philosopher coming in and telling you the games that you like, the games that you play, are wrong or right. Uh, that's not it. I'm not putting them up on a pedestal just to knock them down. Nothing like that. It's all about sort of coming up with this conversation. Because as Aaron mentioned, with those great works, um, they're really meant to be intertextual conversations. A lot of different works just kind of talk to one another. Um, so later in my presentation, I'll go through one of the parts of uh, uh, my article on Ocarina of Time, which is one of the first games that I looked at for the series. Um, and I want to make note here that while I am going to be focusing on the storytelling and theming sort of aspects of it, the way I structure the articles and the way that uh, the other folks who write for me structure them is uh, we take a look at the story, the characters, and the themes, of course, but we also take a look at the gameplay, the music, the visuals, the impact on culture, gaming culture, uh, the history of development, of the developer, the publisher, things like that. So we try to be as all-inclusive as possible. But for the sake of brevity and for uh, the presentation, we're just going to take a look at the story of Ocarina of Time today. Um, so, without further ado, I have a picture of Dante Alighieri's The Divine Comedy up there. Has anyone read any part of... Uh... Oh, great! Okay, <laughs> fantastic. So then maybe you will be able to uh, identify with this. When Aaron and I were uh, coming up through our respective colleges, we happened to read Dante's Inferno at the same time. And we had a discussion that boiled down to a joke that we now tell each other, which is, hey, this Dante guy really knows what he's doing, right? And we kind of felt silly for saying that because it's a classic, right? It's kind of silly to say, oh, this thing that everyone knows and praises is pretty good. <laughs> it actually kind of works out. Um, and what this alludes to, I think, is this sort of uh, idea that a lot of people do where they take the classics for granted. Um, there's a reason the classics, the classics are classics. And I think that when we sort of uh, shelve them away and just sort of label them the classics, we don't really get to learn what they're telling us or what they're telling us about their respective mediums, uh, or media rather. So I have three pictures up here. One of uh, Billy Shakes, a man, right? Um, so I think that a pitfall that we fall into a lot is We'll say things like, oh, Hamlet, of course it's good, it's a classic. Uh, but that sort of takes away from it. I mean, there's a reason that Hamlet persists to this day, right? There's a reason that it exists across multi-cultural uh, boundaries and things like this. There's a reason we still talk about it and learn from it. So instead of saying this statement and just sort of putting it aside, I like to ask the question, what about this work is so good that we call it a classic? We go into the argument, all right, we know it's a classic, but why? What happened with it? So, to bring it back to uh, sort of the realm of video games, let's take a look at The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. How many, uh, how many of you have played it? You ever heard of it? Okay, so you know about Zelda. Cool. Um, it's this little venture old Miyamoto came up with. Um, but, uh, so we're going to take a look at this now. So I think that this is one of the... Um, a lot has been written about Ocarina of Time, and justly so. And I think it's fair to say that it's a classic. Um, but I don't want to shelve that by just sort of putting that label on it and never looking at it again. I don't think any of you guys do either. But, if you take a look at the accolades, right? It has the Guinness World Record still for the highest ranked game of all time. 99% on Metacritic and Game Facts. And it's widely considered, I think, to be one of the best, if not the best Zelda game. And even if you don't want to put that sort of qualifying language on it, 
It's certainly the game after which all the other Zelda titles have sort of been made. It's kind of the template for Zelda now. Uh, they're kind of getting away with that, uh, away from that with Breath of the Wild, but I would still argue that there's a lot of things that are present in that game. Um, but the question is, why is the game praised so highly, and does it deserve that praise? I would argue yes. I imagine a lot of you would also argue yes, right? Mm. Yes. Your silence speaks volumes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's where this series that I run comes in, now loading the video game canon, where we try to figure out what about a game makes it a classic, or what about a game makes you not want to talk about it again, right? So in this case, let's take a look. Uh, and like I said, we're going to be focusing on the storytelling uh, aspect of this, and since it's a visual medium for storytelling, we're just going to take a look at the story, characters, and theme. How many of you are familiar with this? Oh, great, you guys are, you guys are honest. Okay, so that was a trick question. You're actually all familiar with this? This is the hero's journey. Uh, it's uh, also known as the monomyth. Um, put together by Joseph Campbell, Josie Cams, as we call him in academia. Um, <laughs> so Joseph Campbell was a uh, scholar of myth, fairy tales, stories, and as he was looking at uh, origin myths and fairy tales, folk tales all across the world in different cultures, he noticed that of all the stories that are told, you can kind of boil it down into a formula, and this is the formula he came up with. Um, the best example of it uh, that I think most people will find is just the first Star Wars. Uh, the first Star Wars was written by George Lucas uh, directly to be an adaptation of this formula. He said, I'm going to have sci-fi fantasy in space, and there's going to be heroes crossing, th uh, crossing thresholds all over the place. And there were. Um, but I think what's great about Ocarina of Time is that it sort of perfectly models this monomyth, this idea of the hero's journey. Um, and now that's not to say that no other game does. I would say that a lot of games do, most stories do, as I said earlier. But I think that Ocarina of Time is the best example of it, and I'll go through that a little bit with you here. So let's take a look at the characters. So most of you are familiar with uh, sort of the Zelda universe, so most of you are familiar with this, uh, the Triforce, this sort of mythical triumvirate of uh, attributes. You have power, wisdom, and courage. And what's so interesting about Ocarina of Time to me is that each of the three characters, the three real main characters, they represent these attributes for good and for bad. And this is very fairy tale, this is very folk myth. Um, so like Ganondorf, for example, the big bad guy on top there. He's power. Power is amazing. Power can create, it can destroy, but it can also corrupt. Likewise, wisdom with Zelda. We see that uh, she's very headstrong in the beginning of the game. She's very smart, she's very intelligent, but she lacks wisdom because ultimately everything that happens is kind of her fault, right? So at the end of the game, she learns through her mistakes, she gains wisdom. That's the good of it. The bad of it is all the mistakes she made. And then lastly, we have Link, the main character, whose sole defining attribute is courage. Now, that's good and bad for a number of reasons, but I'm going to posit to you. It's good because, of course, heroes should be courageous. Heroes should be brave. They should want to storm the castle. They should want to take out the dragon, right? But also, especially in terms of video games, you die a lot when you're headstrong and you're, you're brave, right? You go into things. You mess up puzzles, you get hurt, and you die. Lots of game overs if you're a little too brave. So, what about the player character, though? What about you when you're playing this? It's an interactive medium, so you are kind of a character as well, the player is. So let's take a look at Link. Link is a silent hero. I'm sure you've all heard the term silent protagonist, particularly with Zelda, maybe more largely with Nintendo. What Zelda does with it is a little more interesting than the rest of Nintendo, I would wager. Um, and it's because, let's take a look at Link. Link is a young boy, he's an outsider. Uh, he doesn't really belong anywhere. Um, he's silent, he never says a word in the game other than his grunts and everything. And uh, because of the limitations of the N64, he's not that expressive either. So he's sort of the perfect blank slate. But what do we know about Link? Well, we know he's the avatar of courage. And since you're playing as Link, you're primed to identify with the avatar of courage. So you are the courageous one. You're the hero. So in these three photos, these are sort of different moments in Campbell's monomyth. You have the uh, wise old guy telling the hero about what's going on in the world. You have the hero crossing the threshold, taking the master sword, taking on the basically the, uh, the pledge to destroy evil. And then you have him doing that at the end, destroying evil and saving everything. But even though it's Link in the game, you're the one controlling him. You're the one doing it. You're put in the driver's seat. So, a theme in this game, as I see it, 
biggest thing is that every character, every story beat, every action you take all reinforces this idea that you're the hero, right? And that's kind of a magical thing. Because take Star Wars again for an example. You're watching Luke Skywalker's journey, and he's undoubtedly a hero in, the, in A New Hope, right? And uh, he's going through the hero's journey, we see his highs and lows. But you're basically a spectator. You can imagine what you would do in that situation, but you can't do it because it's up there on the screen, you're watching it. In a game, you can do it. And especially in Ocarina of Time, you're not just seeing it, you're having it. You're taking the hero's journey. So, when I take a look at whether a game should be in the canon or not, as I see it, I take a look at whether or not the theme should be remembered, and I think in this case it does. Let's go back to Aaron's example about Spec Ops and Apocalypse Now and Heart of Darkness. So, you are rarely going to get a truly original story. Every story has been told before, right? But the magical thing about video games is that they can offer things that other media can't. In this case, or in uh, the Spec Ops case, right, you have uh, Heart of Darkness, a novel where you're reading about these events. Then you have Apocalypse Now. Cinema transformed it, it made it a visual, visceral medium where you actually see the horror, the horror, right? And then Spec Ops The Line, you have a, you, you are basically told directly that you're an inhuman monster and that you've done all these horrible things and that you're the problem player. Um, to use a lighter example, we have Ocarina of Time, where you actually go on the journey, you do all of these things, you save the princess, you save Hyrule, and you get thanked at the end. It's your journey. So in my mind, this is a true classic, for a number of reasons. Uh, what I said today is just one of many. But I think it deserves to be called a classic. But uh, you shouldn't stop there. You shouldn't just say, it's good, stamped, done, put it away. You should keep looking at it because there's a lot that it has to offer. There's a lot that it has to offer, not only of within the game itself, but of video games in general, the medium, that you can take a look at and see, oh, remember what Ocarina of Time did with this narrative? Remember how you were in the driver's seat? I wonder how other games subvert that. I wonder how other games do that. Um, and then also, it helps to look back on different type of media, like cinema and novels and plays and all kinds of different things, to see where it fits in the grand scheme of just art in general. So, with that in mind, uh, we mentioned at the beginning that we'd like to have sort of a conversation with you guys about one of these ten games.